I'm Natalia Ortiz, and this is Currents. Pakistan is back in the news with Pakistani Christians on high alert after the death of Osama bin Laden. Plus, Friday was opening day for the movie on Opus Day. God has called us to manifest it in law, here on earth. Even if they are wrong. Yes, Juan. Even if they are wrong. And Vito Vonifaci makes its faith-filled debut on the silver screen. The movie's objective was to have people come to a deeper understanding of life's true purpose. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Matt McClure has the night off. The people of Pakistan remain on edge following news last week of the takedown of Osama bin Laden. On Friday, a group of Muslims protesters gathered in Abbottabad, not far from where Osama bin Laden was killed. They claim that bin Laden was, in fact, not living in the place where the U.S. says the al-Qaeda leader was killed. The protesters accuse the U.S. of being the root of terrorism in Pakistan. The situation is especially uncertain for Pakistan's Christian community, a religious minority made up mostly of Catholics, which accounts for just 1% of the country's 170 million people. The news of bin Laden's death came hot on the heels of the assassinations earlier this year of two Pakistani officials, both of whom favored overturning the country's harsh blasphemy laws. For more on the latest in the aftermath of bin Laden's death, I'm joined now by Father Ilyas Gill, coordinator of the Pakistani Apostolate for the Diocese of Brooklyn. Thank you so much for being with us today, Father. Thank you very much, Natalia. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well. Our first question is, why would Christians in Pakistan need to be on high alert right now? Um, we understand that sectarian violence has, is nothing new to Pakistan. The Christian in Pakistan have to always high alert because they always connected with America or European countries because these countries are Christian countries and they think that we support them. So therefore, always the Pakistani Christian, they are on high alert after such a situation, especially the terrorist attacks takes place or any things happen in the Muslim countries. Okay. So we are always be blamed. Okay, and uh, you know, we've heard of schools being closed, churches being guarded. What other things are you hearing from your you know, contacts back in Pakistan? Most of the people being asked to stay home also, those who are working in uh, different areas of life. And they said, be careful what you say, and uh, you know very well anything can be blamed that you are connected with America. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they cut off the masses and the specialist schools were closed and the churches are being protected by the Pakistani government. What are some of the things that are happening or that you're hearing locally here within the Pakistani community in Brooklyn or Queens? They have a big concern because most of the their families are there mm -hmm. and every time they call them and they ask them, how do you feel? They feel that we are very depressed. We don't right. know anything can happen. All the time we are hearing that uh, it's, uh, America has attacked mm -hmm. not only this Osama bin Laden, but especially the Muslim community. Correct. So, What um, are some of the things that you might recommend uh, the people of Pakistan, the Christians in Pakistan, do to protect themselves? Or what are they doing? Actually, our main weapon is to pray. Okay. That's always we believe in. The prayer can change the heart of the people. Mm -hmm. And we thank God. We are brought up in a such a way that we always believe that prayer can only change. And our humbleness mm -hmm. always make a change in the world. And that is our belief. And we are not uh, people who create troubles. Okay. We are peaceful people. And we are very loyal to the country and to our, our government leaders as well. Father so Gill, um, would you say that Christians are easy targets in Pakistan or the Middle East? Yes, because we don't have any army, we are being easy targeted and uh, we are promoter of love and peace and we promote uh, forgiveness and tolerance. So therefore it's very easy to target them because it seems that we have a different ideology, different understanding about life and living together as the brothers and sisters. So I do believe that the, this incident will change the mentality of many good Muslim people in Pakistan. 
and the change is coming I can say gradually because people are getting more aware what is happening around the globe and through the media and the people try their best to find out the truth mm -hmm. which is good thing and especially the young people are coming forward and speaking out is this evidence of a larger problem, uh, indicative perhaps of intolerance, religious intolerance? Yeah, it is the biggest problem, religious intolerance over there. But I still feel there are good, willing people out there who are trying their best to bring peace and harmony among the different religions as well. Even the government has made a special uh, cabinet of this so that they can bring harmony and peace among the different religions as well. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Father Gill. You're welcome, Natalia. It's my pleasure. So thank you for having me here. Thank you. Stay tuned. There's more currents ahead. Tempers flared as Muslims and Christians clashed over the weekend in Egypt. We'll have the latest on that and the rest of the day's headlines next. But first, yesterday was Mother's Day, and we visited St. Athanasius Parish in Bay Ridge after Sunday Mass to ask a few questions about Mother's Day and mothers, including who was the first mother mentioned in the Bible? First mother mentioned in the Bible. Mary? That would be Eve. Eve. Cut Mary. Mary. Mother Mary. Oh, no, I don't remember. La primera primera. Mother Mary. Eve. Eve. <laughs> Let's do it again. I'll give you the right answer next time. <laughs> Mary. Eve. Blessed Mother, yeah. Eve? I have the slightest idea. Right now, I'm not thinking. The one that I know is Mary. The very first mother is Eve. Oh, that old lady. <laughs> oh, my God. The Blessed Mother. No? Eve. That's Eve. cheating. That's <laughs> cheating. Don't cheat. <laughs> Eve. He said Eve. I'll agree with him. <laughs> Welcome back to Currents, I'm Natalia Ortiz. Coming up later, Catholic Faith on Film. We'll take a closer look at two movies in theaters now. First, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Twelve people were killed, at least 230 more were injured, and a Coptic church went up in flames as Muslims and Christians resumed fighting in Cairo, Egypt this weekend. The two sides clashed outside the church following rumors that a Christian woman who converted to Islam was being held there against her will. A small group of Christians gathered outside the U.S. Embassy in Cairo to urge the international community to, pr to protect them. Meanwhile, Egypt's prime minister called an emergency meeting of the country's cabinet to discuss the violence. Meanwhile, the internet was abuzz this weekend over news from Ireland that a Catholic parish there was going to offer two Masses for Osama bin Laden. The Mass intentions were reportedly printed in the parish bulletin and posted on the church's website without the pastor's knowledge. Reports say, though, it was all a hoax. The pastor said he was very upset by it and confirmed that Masses would not be offered for bin Laden. Bishops in one region of the Philippines are getting the word out about possible retaliatory attacks by supporters of Osama bin Laden. One bishop told a newspaper in the Philippines that their threats are real there. According to another bishop, everyone is vulnerable to terrorism and needs to pray in order to defeat evil. Brazil's highest court has unanimously approved same-sex civil unions. The Supreme Court judges argued that Brazil's constitution does not specifically ban same-sex unions. The Catholic Church argued against that, saying the constitution only referred to unions of one man and one woman. Brazil is home to more than 145 million Catholics, which is more than any other country in the world. From Washington, House Speaker John Boehner has nominated a Catholic priest to be the next House chaplain. Boehner, who is also Catholic, chose Father Patrick Conroy, a Jesuit priest who was previously a chaplain at Georgetown University. Conroy would be the second Catholic priest to serve as House chaplain. The full House still has to vote to confirm the nomination. And a former House Speaker will reportedly throw his hat into the presidential race. Newt Gingrich will announce, announce his candidacy for the White House on Wednesday, according to a spokesman who says Gingrich will make the announcement on Twitter and Facebook. Gingrich converted to Catholicism back in 2009. According to a CNN poll, 
only 10% of Republicans would choose him as their candidate in 2012. Sarah Palin, Mitt Romney, Donald Trump, and Mike Huckabee all rank higher. In related news, former Pillsbury executive Herman Cain will announce his candidacy later this month, following a strong performance last week in a debate with other likely GOP candidates. Meanwhile, the Fighting Irish are putting down their dukes. The University of Notre Dame has reached an agreement with a group of pro-life protesters arrested at the school back in 2009. The group prayed and held pro-life signs to protest Notre Dame's decision to award President Obama an honorary degree at that year's graduation ceremony. They were arrested for trespassing on campus. The protesters, ar protesters argued that the school should not have been honoring Obama, who favors abortion rights. Closer to home, the Brooklyn Diocese's newspaper, The Tablet, and the Knights of Columbus honored the winners of their Easter People contest. The second grade winner, Elijah Singh from Our Lady of Lords School in Queens Village. Come on, Elijah. Congratulations. We're honoring the uh, elementary school winners of our Easter artwork contest. We had almost 200 entries here, and tonight we're going to honor one uh, student from each grade level for the best uh, piece of art from that grade level. We looked at all of the entries, and people asked me, well, what's the criteria? Why did these particular people win? We were looking at two things. First, we were looking for the theme to come through what Easter means to me. We wanted to see that they understood what Easter was all about. And then second, we looked at the artwork. So if, if both of them had the correct theme, then uh, the deciding point would be the quality of the art. I was very pleased with what I saw. I mean, the message of the church is getting through, you know, that Easter is a holy day, that it's the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And from looking at the art, I had the impression that the kids really understood what this was all about. I really draw these pictures because this is what Easter means to me. It means Jesus rising from the dead, Jesus, new life. I drew lots of Easter eggs and I also did an orange background. Sometimes kids just think it's about chocolate bunnies and getting presents and Easter eggs, but it really means more and sometimes they don't understand that. I want to make it look interesting so they can learn both meanings of the Easter. This is important. You know, we want them to know that uh, going to church and learning about their religion in school is, is something that should be valued. And so that's why we put up a prize and that they're being singled out for their creativity for this religious thing. So we, we hope that uh, they understand that it means something to us and we hope that we pass the faith along to them. Turning now to the Vatican, Pope Benedict encouraged the newest members of the Swiss Guard to widen their horizons. Benedict spoke to them before their swearing-in ceremony on Friday. The Swiss Guard is responsible for the safety of the Pope. The Pope said he hoped they would use their time in Rome as an opportunity to deepen their Christian faith. And during a two-day trip to northern Italy this weekend, Benedict visited Venice. In addition to celebrating Mass for more than 300,000 people, the Pope also took time out for a gondola ride through the city's famous canals. The gondola took him from the Venice's historic St. Mark's Square to the city's Basilica de Santa Maria de la Salute, or the Basilica of St. Maria of Health. During his visit, Benedict urged Italians to welcome immigrants fleeing unrest in their homelands. The issue has generated a lot of controversy in Italy as migrants from Libya attempt to escape violence amid calls for Muammar Gaddafi to step down. In related news, the United Nations says a boat carrying more than 600 migrants from Libya sank off that country's coast on Friday. A UN advisor says the boat was headed to Italy. The Italian Coast Guard was able to rescue many of the passengers, but the number of casualties is not yet known. Stay tuned, there's more currents ahead when we return the early life of the founder of Opus Dei. That story comes to the big screen. But first, more on Mother's Day from parishioners at St. Athanasius Church here in Brooklyn. We asked what was the best advice their mother gave, and here's what they had to say. The best advice my mother ever gave is always tell the truth. Never to do anything wrong, always do things right. To be a good person. Be strong. Grow up, be happy, and work. To love your children, love your family. Family's everything. Love everyone in the world, always, no matter what. 
She's passed away a long time ago, but this is the, my mother of today. She's my to always go to church and to um, love one another. Don't drop out of school. To marry him. To just always follow, follow my dream. Un dicho que siempre ella tiene es persevera y alcanza. El que siempre persevera siempre alcanza. All through my life, I, I, I find myself telling other people uh, the things that my mother told me. Welcome back. A quick glance at this weekend's box office numbers would tell you one thing. America was definitely in the mood for action and adventure. Thor, the Norse god of thunder, hammered the competition to take the top slot, bringing Fast Five's reign on the top of the charts to a grinding halt. But in between the fast cars and superheroes, you could also find Academy Award-winning director Roland Joffe's historic epic, There Be Dragons. Set during the Spanish Civil War, the story traces the lives of two childhood friends who would go their separate ways during that war. One would survive the persecution of Catholic priests and create the lay movement known as Opus Dei, or Work of God. The other would choose war over peace, but each would have to confront their dragons. Action! Action! Well, Roland Joffe is a fascinating character, and he's a guy that's made some amazing films. He was at a point in his life that he wanted to get back to movies that really matter. For him, this is a movie about love and the absence of love and that with love, we can face our dragons, that part of our lives that threatens to conquer us. The focus is on Saint Jose Maria, who was the founder of Opus Dei, and Manolo. Jose Maria comes to understand that suffering can somehow be redemptive. Faith is a gift, and God has called us to manifest it in love, here on earth. Unwavering love for every child of God, no matter who it is. No matter what side, no matter what circumstances. Even if they are wrong. Yes, Juan. Even if they are wrong. And the other who flatly rejects that notion, suffering has no meaning. The truth is, we are born alone and we die alone. All we have in between is suffering to it. Each of us have, have the struggles that we, that we face, uh, anger or something that's happened and we don't understand why. Jose Maria responded with faith and love to the challenges they had. And this other character is wrapped up in the bitterness of the period. During the Spanish Civil War, they were killing priests and bishops and nuns simply because they were in any way connected with the establishment. Paul, they started killing priests. We have to leave. It's suicide to stay. Now, especially now, we have to be source of peace. That costume of yours won't protect you anymore. I don't wear this for protection. Here's a film coming out less than a week after the beatification of, of John Paul II. Go and then you see this cheerful priest, this dedicated priest. If we do them for love, each daily task can give him glory. I think the film is a wonderful reminder that the church has many, many great and holy priests. And one of the biggest themes in the film is forgiveness. There's a father-son story. Manolo, our bad guy, and his son, Robert, have never had a real relationship. And amazingly, the actor who plays Manolo, Wes Bentley, was going through something like that in real life. And it was through playing the character, being on the deathbed as an old man, that he realized, gosh, this is me. I could die this way separated from the ones I love. It's Jose Maria Escriva, and on the left, your father. I found out that you were in a seminary with Jose Maria Escriva. I warn you, leave it alone, Roberto. Because of the example of Jose Maria, his friend, we see Manolo finally get to that point where he needs to reconcile with his son. There's a beautiful moment in the movie that challenges the viewer to say, I've got places like that in my life. It challenged Wes to seek that healing and that forgiveness during the making of the film. So we believe people who watch the film could be impacted by it, and that's what we're so excited about. Stay tuned, there's more currents ahead.
But first, we head back to St. Athanasius to find out what some loving sons and daughters would give mom if they had $1 million. If I had $1 million, what would I buy for my mother? Anything I could. She gave me life. I'd get my mother back if I had a million dollars. A vacation. <laughs> oh, I would love that. A cruise. <laughs> I hope it would be a cruise. If I had a million dollars? A house? I, I'd buy this church. And a million dollars? You know, that's such an unusual question. Health. That's about it. Money can't buy that. The whole thing. And a lot of love. Una casa. En El Salvador. Well, would I give my mother if I won a million dollars? I wouldn't give it a roll, but I'll give a half, the half I would enjoy. But the best thing I can give her is the grace of God. Finally tonight, another film with faith at its foundation made its debut on the silver screen this weekend. Vito Bonifaci, In Search of the Truth. Ripped from the pages of the director's true life story, a midlife crisis triggers a soul-searching journey of faith for Vito Bonifaci, a successful building contractor who's got everything the world can offer, except for the answers to life's biggest questions. Last week, Matt had a chance to sit with John Martocha, the film's writer, director, and inspiration for the movie's lead. We got the story behind the story, and we also learned what inspires Martocha to bring the holy to Hollywood. Well, uh, John, thanks so much for being here on Currents. Thank you. We Thank appreciate you your time. Here. Well, uh, you know, it's it's uh, an interesting thing when we have, you know, I've had f filmmakers on the show before and things like that, but you uh, had never done this before this no. film. Tell me a little bit about your life prior to this film. <laughs> well, my life prior to the film, um, truthfully, wasn't a very good life. Um, I wasn't, uh, I was baptized and confirmed a Catholic, but I really never practiced the faith at all. Uh, as a kid, uh, it was, we never went to Mass. Um, so my life, really, I got caught up into, throughout my life, into the material world. I mean, my, my gods essentially were uh, money. That was a god, uh, you know, seeking pleasure. Right. Sex, money, uh, heavy into alcohol. Drugs when I was a young kid. What uh, was it that, that kind of turned things around for you? I, you know, Scripture says the lowly in spirit will be exalted, the proud in spirit will be brought low. I had, to, I had to hit rock bottom. I had to go through some suffering in my life. I lost my father due to brain cancer. He was um, very close to me. At that time, he was the only man I actually trusted. And at that time, the person I only felt that I really loved was my father. Uh, my mother, after my father's death, uh, was in and out of the hospital. She became mentally ill. Um, I started to drink heavily at that time. Uh, there was a divorce. My wife filed for divorce. So I separated from my wife and my kids at that time, all within a very short period of time. Uh, also, I had some financial problems with my business at that time. So all these things that were gods to me, in a sense, I was losing. Again, the lowly in spirit will be exalted. The proud in spirit will be brought low. I had to be brought low through this suffering. Right. And I turned to the Lord. I mean, I started reading Scripture. Um, I was really reading the Old Testament primarily. I couldn't really accept the teachings of Christ. I would get to the New Testament. I would like, I just couldn't yeah. accept it. You know, I like the Old Testament. An eye for an eye, a right. tooth for a tooth, you know. <laughs> You know, a man was successful. God rewarded him with money and prosperity and concubines and wives. And yeah. so it was really something I could identify with being very materialistic myself. So when I would come to the New Testament, uh, right. uh, take turn the, the other cheek. And all that, yeah. 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 Let's move on really quick to, I want to talk about the, the film, obviously. It's a, as the name suggests, it's about a guy named Vito. Right. Um, tell me a little bit about the film and the inspiration for it. Well, the inspiration for Vito was really based on my personal conversion. Uh, so I wanted to create a fictional character who would go through this transformation, who live, would leave the material world behind and come to really focus on, on the spiritual, the spiritual nature of life. So this, he has this dream that really shatters him. And he's living a very superficial life, guiding by the material realm, like I was and like many people are. Mm. So when he has this dream, it precipitates, provokes thought. And through this, many has dialogues with his gardener, with his... Uh, 
the housekeeper with his wife, um, has flashbacks to him as a youth. So he's really seeking, is there, is there life after death? Is there a day of judgment? Is there a day of accountability? Am I a good person? What, you know, what is this thing called eternal life? Yeah. Is there such a thing as eternal life? So this is what the movie's objective was to have people come to a deeper understanding of life's true purpose. Yeah. There is something more to the world than this material realm. There is a day of accountability. Sure. And this movie comes out at a time when, I mean, you've got also uh, um, There Be Dragons that, that is uh, coming out. You've got, I think, Soul Surfer was a movie that came out a couple right. of weeks back. A lot of movies with heavily Christian themes. Do you think that maybe the public might be more accepting or ready for something like that right now since we have so many of these coming out at once? Yeah, I think the public obviously is thirsty, especially our youth, the younger generation. We're thirsty for truth. You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. So we, I think our young children have seen so much, they see much, so much brokenness around us mm -hmm. that they're becoming, they're, 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 rather than despairing, they're, 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 there's a hope. There's a hope. So, there you go. So I think this, the time is right sure. for a new, a new evangelization, a new media to bring forth truth to people. There you go. Well, that's yeah. it right there. Well, John, thanks so much for just out of time, but we really appreciate you coming in to talk about okay. it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. And that is it for this edition of Currents. Coming up tomorrow, should it matter if a priest is black or white? We asked that question during Sunday's National Day of Prayer for Black Vocations. Until then, be sure to visit us online at currentsny.net. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Natalia Ortiz. Thanks for watching and have a great night. Mm -hmm.